بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين إن شاء الله if you could just put your phones on vibrate um, إن شاء الله we're going to continue سورة البقرة تفسير um, verse number 62 بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so it's chapter 2 verse 62 I'll read the uh, Arabic إن شاء الله and then translate إن الذين آمنوا والذين هادوا والنصارى والصابئين من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر وعمل صالحا فلهم أجرهم عند ربهم ولا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. Okay, which means that no doubt the people who became Muslims and the people who became Jews and Christians and Sabians who believe from among them in Allah and the Day of Judgment and did good works for them is is their reward with their Lord and upon them is no fear and neither shall they be sorrowful. Okay, now um, here we know who the Muslims are, who the Jews and the Christians are. The term that is new to uh, most of us is the term Sabians, right? And in Arabic it's Sabi'een, right? Now there's a difference of opinion about who the Sabians actually were. And according to Sufyan al uh, one of the great muhaddithin uh, in the early period of Islam, uh, he said that Layth bin Abu Sulaym said that Mujahid said, Mujahid is one of the great uh, Mufassirin of the Qur'an, one of the great commentators in the Qur'an. So, Sufyan actually cites the opinion of Mujahid. Mujahid is a name you should know because it's just so big in tafsir. There's really no way that you can um, come across any tafsir without coming across this name, Mujahid. He's one of the big names in tafsir or explanation of the Qur'an. So, what did he say then about the Sabians, about their identity? He said, the Sabians are between the Majus, the Jews, and the Christians. They do not have a specific religion. So, basically, he's saying that they're neither Jews, nor Christians, nor Majus. Majus, they were the fire worshippers, right? Now, um, you also have, uh, to go into further detail, they said that the Sabians are a sect among the people of the book. This is another opinion. So the first opinion was that, that, that of Mujahid. The second opinion is that they are a sect among the people of the book who used to read the Zabur, the Psalms of David. The Zabur are the Psalms of David. So the second opinion about them is that they are a sect among the people of the book who used to read the Zabur, which are the Psalms of David. Third opinion is that there are people who worship the angels or the stars. Okay, so these are the three opinions about the identity of who these people were that were called uh, al Sabi'in or Sabians. And it appears that the closest opinion to the, the, the truth, Allahu Alam, is the statement of Mujahid, the first opinion. That seems to be the closest to the uh, truth. That they are not Jews or Christians or Majus, neither are they polytheists, yani they're not Mushrikeen either. They do not have a specific religion that they followed. They did not have a specific religion with like regulations and rules and, and sharia. Uh, rather, they lived according to the fitrah, according to uh, the natural, uh, the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us upon. So they had not deviated um, in the sense that they became polytheists, nor were they followers of an organized divine religion. Rather, they were on the fitrah. Okay, so they didn't have a, a set religion. So, um, this is why uh, the Mushrikeen, when anyone became um, Muslim in uh, Arabia, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ brought the message of Islam, when anyone became Muslim, the Mushrikeen would call him a, a, a Sabi. Yani he has uh, become uh, one of them because those people are on the fitrah. So this is what the Mushrikeen associated Islam with, uh, the religion of these people. They were known to um, be those people that abandoned all the religions that existed in the world. So they were of no known religion. And then there's another opinion. You don't have to worry about this. But some scholars say that the Sabians are those who never received a message by, uh, by any prophet. So there is some you know, debate about the real identity of who these Sabians were. There's uh, you know, no, uh, the, the, the closest opinion uh, or to the truth, Allah Alam, is the statement of Mujahid. Is that they're neither Jews nor Christians nor Majus. They don't have a specific organized uh, religion. Okay, now what does this ayah mean, right? Um, this ayah is talking about that as long as a person has uh, faith, as long as a person uh, believes, they will, um, uh, inshallah, have the reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, we know from other uh, parts of the Qur'an that the only acceptable religion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam, okay? So this ayah does not mean that if you're a Jew or a Christian, it's okay with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not what the ayah uh, means. The ayah rather, uh, the explanation or the meaning of the ayah that you'll find in Surah Ali Imran is that no deen is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than the uh, deen of Islam. 
Okay, let's move on. Now, inshallah, I'm only going to read the uh, English. No, no, verse 63. And when we took covenant with you and raised above you the Mount of Tur, hold firmly to the book which we have given you and remember what is in it, that you, so that you shall be God-fearing. Okay, now... What does this mean? What what uh, covenant are they talking about? What is the mount? What does it mean that the mountain was raised above them? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the commands to Bani Israel, right? And this is the subject uh, of the surah at this point of the verses that we're on. Uh, we're talking about Bani Israel and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to them the laws, gave Musa the guidance. And they still refused to believe. They were, they were hesitant to obey. In fact, they were openly sinning. They had taken the calf for worship while Musa was receiving the commandments, the uh, Torah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were worshipping the calf in the desert. So um, to threaten them, to scare them, what Allah did is he raised the mountain of Tur over them so that it was raised and it was hovering over them like a shadow. So this is what the ayah is referring to. And when we took the covenant with you and raised above you the mount of Tur, okay? So the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised this mount Tur over them and it was overshadowing them as a threat of their stubbornness. Because obviously when something is overshadowing you, there is this feeling of the likelihood that it may fall, right? That didn't happen, but it was a, a threat. So because of that, um, they actually started obeying for a while. They started complying with the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but soon they went back to their... Uh, ways and inshallah you'll see in more detail the uh, sins and transgressions that were uh, unfortunately committed uh, by this group of people verse 64 then you turn back thereafter so but for the bounty and mercy of Allah on you you would have been destroyed okay so only Allah subhanahu was giving them respite giving them chances over and over and over again because he is al-halim one of the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he is forbearing right this is what we mentioned before and we see this in his mu'amala with the uh, past nations is that he does not punish immediately he does not take to task immediately rather he uh, gives them chances so he was doing this in the case of Bani Israel as well 65 and you have known well those amongst you who had transgressed the Sabbath so we said to them be you apes despised and humiliated Okay, now we all know the story of the Sabbath, right? Um, in the Sharia of Bani Israel, they were allowed to work six days a week. And the Sabbath was the day of rest, yani the day of worship uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were not allowed to do any type of worldly work on the day of the Sabbath. Now to test them, um, and you know, they used to catch fish. They were fishermen, right? And to, to test them, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused to happen is that the fish would appear in great numbers and abundance on Saturday. This is to see if they were going to follow the commandment or not. So they um, thought of a way to get around uh, this prohibition of not working on the Sabbath, right? So what they would do is they would have their tents ready um, before, the night before, so that when the fish would appear, they would become caught in the net and they would be able to then, you know, uh, uh, catch the fish. So this was their transgression of the Sabbath after it was clearly marked as a day of uh, worship, a day of no worldly work. So this is what the ayah is referring to in verse um, 65. And actually, um, it, it is, it, it's recorded in Exodus uh, in the Bible. Israelites enjoined to keep the Sabbath as a sign between me and you throughout the generations. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord, whoever, whosoever doeth work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. So it was very extreme in their Sharia. It wasn't like our Juma, where the uh, tijara or the business uh, worldly dealings are only paused for the prayer, right? Um, the time of the prayer, you know, at that time, obviously you're not supposed to do anything. All the shops should be closed. You should not be engaging in any business interaction at that time, right? However, it says in the Quran and Surah Al Juma, right, that after the uh, prayer is over, then you can disperse in the line. You can continue. You know, you could go to the store. You could uh, continue on as you were before. However, it was not the case for the uh, Bani Israel. They had some strict um, laws. Some of their laws were actually a lot more strict than our uh, laws. So they were not able to. They were not supposed to work the whole day, and whoever did was it was punishable by death. So the death penalty was, you know, uh, applicable then. So, however, um, 
what happened in the earlier generations, it wasn't as bad, but slowly as Bani Israel began to degenerate further and further, they began to openly desecrate the Sabbath. They started doing work openly. Like it wasn't even something that they tried to find a loophole for. Rather, they began working in it openly. They started doing business, uh, so on and so forth. So um, now here in verse uh, 65, it mentions that they were turned into apes. And a lot of times people uh, have this question, is that, literally true or is it a symbolic uh you know um indication of how they were uh, you know humiliated or their minds were like those of animals you know the different interpretations can come to mind however from the words of the quran it does appear that in fact they were actually physically transformed into apes and one of the mufassirin mentions that in order to perfect this uh the torture of this punishment their minds were kept fully human Yani, they were completely aware that, oh my God, I have been transformed into an ape. And they could see that and feel that, but their minds are the minds of, of human beings. So, uh, you know, astaghfirullah, this is um, one of the rare, um, horrible punishments seen in this world for their transgression. And, you know, when this is happening from, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is al-Rahim, al-Halim, you know, the forbearing, the merciful one, when he sees inflating a punishment of this nature, we can uh, you know, imagine the extent of the transgression, the open rebellion, the stubbornness, the extent of that you know, must have been really unbelievable. <clears throat> okay, now let's go on. Uh, so then verse 66 ends that uh, part of the passage with, then we made this event an example and a lesson for those people who were uh, in that time and for the times to come an admonition to the God-fearing. So obviously this was a les lesson not for the, just for the people of that time, the fact that they were, they were turned into apes, but also a huge lesson for coming uh, generations. Okay, now, and also it is said about the, um, when they were turned into apes, is that they would, uh, because their mind was intact, they would look at each other and cry. That this has happened to us um, because of our, you know, because of what we used to do. So their faces were turned into the faces of of, um, uh, of apes. And after it is said that after three days, they all died. After three days, they all died. And this incident, um, it is reported in, in, in the tafsir that took place in the time of Dawood, alayhi salam. If you're trying to uh, think of a historical context, it is the time of Dawood, alayhi salam, right? We know Dawood is one of the prophets of Bani Israel. Okay, um, moving on to verse 67. And when Musa said to his people, God commanded to sacrifice a cow. They said, do you make fun with us? He said, Allah forbid that I become of those who are ignorant of the jahilin. Okay, now what is the background behind this? We all know about uh, the cow, the incident of the cow, right? Because Surah Al-Baqarah, after all, is named after uh, the cow. What had happened is, why did Musa salam, command them to sacrifice a cow? The background behind that is actually a man was murdered in the Bani Israel. And everyone was blaming the other for the murder. No one was taking responsibility because obviously it was a very serious thing. When someone was murdered, um, punish, punishment for that had to be retributed. So they were all, to take off the blame from themselves, everyone was blaming each other. So there was this great potential for horrible fighting to break out among Bani Israel. So to contain the situation, they came to Musa salam, and they said, can you please find out who murdered this man that had been killed? So in response to that, Yani, to resolve this situation of the murdered man, the case of the murdered man, Musa salam, said, you have to, in order to find out about this, or resolve this situation, you have to sacrifice a cow. Now, this apparently doesn't make sense when you first hear about it. What does uh, the case of the murdered have to do with sacrificing a cow, right? This is why they said, Do you take us in jest? Are you making fun of us? That we're asking you to solve the case of this murdered person. You're telling us to sacrifice a cow. Well, what's the connection between the two? This will find out what the connection uh, was. And the first reaction that Musa Sam had to that comment was, أعوذ بالله أن أكون من الجاهلين that I seek refuge in Allah from becoming of the ignorant يعني for making fun of you when you've brought to me such an important case why would I make fun of you so what he's saying is the fact that I'm telling you to sacrifice a cow this is a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is how he wants us to resolve the murder case 
Okay. So then they said, okay, pray to thy Lord for us that he may make clear to us what cow it is. He said, he said, um, Allah says, and he says, she is a cow, neither old nor a virgin, mil mil middling between old age and virginity. So now do that which you are commanded. Yeah, and it's not very old, not very young. It's a cow, uh, you know, um, the age of the cow is in between um, old age and youth. They said, pray to thy Lord for us that he may tell us about her color. He said, he says, the cow is yellow, bright in her color, looks pretty to the beholders. They said, pray to thy Lord for us that he may tell us what kind of cow she is, as we are put in doubt about the cow, and if Allah wills, we shall surely be guided. And then look at the uh, detail in 71 about the description of the cow. He said, he says that she is a cow not laboring in tilling the soil or watering the fields, sound with, from stain or uh, without stain or blemish. They said, now you have brought the correct information. Then they sacrificed the cow. Yani sacrificed her and they did not appear that they would do so. Yani when they sacrificed the cow finally, they did it with a lot of hesitation. Now, let's just stop there and look at what is going on. There's a lot of hesitation in what from Bani Israel towards Musa alayhi salam. Whatever commands he brings, they have this um, you know tightness inside of them. There's no sami'ana wa ata'ana, right? There's no we hear and we obey attitude at all. There's this stubbornness, okay? So this is something that we want to be aware of in our own attitudes, in our own, you know, when we find out about a command, this is we we want to be we want to have sami'ana wa ata'ana approach inshallah not have the stubbornness and not and you look at the excessive questioning that they were engaged in and this is actually in the hadith of the prophet sallallahu meaning of which is that nations were destroyed because of their excessive questioning and their disobedience to their prophets if you want to summarize the reason why nations were destroyed before the ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's because of these two things number one their excessive questioning, asking too many questions, not for the sake of gaining beneficial knowledge, but for the sake of being stubborn and resisting, just opposing the commandments. And number two is disobeying their prophets. So obviously this is going to be a cause of uh, destruction. Now, one of the other, uh, we know that they were um, told to sacrifice a cow to solve this mystery of the murdered. However, at the same time, there was another hikmah or wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on why he chose to resolve the murder in this way. He could have resolved it in any way, right? But specifically he chose to do it with the sacrifice of a cow because the pagans at the time uh, considered the cow sacred. So there was a sanctity associated with the cow. And because the Bani Israel had lived with these people who used to worship the cow, their hearts actually had become attached to cow worship. And they had this sanctity associated uh, with the cow. Uh, in their minds as well, which is why they were worshipping the cow when Musa went to, for 40 days uh, to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get the guidance, they were worshipping the cow. Why? Because they had this attachment in their heart. So to remove that, to cut it at its root, they were ordered to sacrifice um, a cow. Now of course this uh, uh, obviously proved to be a very hard test because look how they tried to get out of it by asking all these questions, hoping that Musa will not be able to provide them an accurate description, hoping that he will not be able to describe it in a way that would make it clear to them so that they would say, well, you haven't made it clear to us, so how can we sacrifice this cow, right? So subhanAllah, however, the more they questioned, the tighter the corner they were uh, pushed into so that they were given an accurate description that they then had to uh, find. So evasion through questioning is not a good technique. Do not try to evade through excessive questioning, trying to find uh, loopholes because it backfired, literally backfired. And so at the end what happened is that they were ordered to sacrifice that very golden colored cow with no tinge of any other color. This cow that they had to find to sacrifice um, could not have any mixture of any other color and it had to be brightly golden, like golden colored yellow. And that was especially chosen for worship at that time. So look, if they hadn't asked all these questions, you know, it wouldn't have, <laughs> subhanAllah, become so difficult for them. Now they had to, uh, that was the cow that was specifically chosen for worship at that time, and that's exactly the one, because of their questions, they were ultimately told to uh, sacrifice. And when they did that, they did it with hesitation, right? Which is indicated in the ayah at the end of 71. وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَلُونَ فَذَبَحُوهَا وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَلُونَ يعني they sacrificed her but you know مَا كَادُوا يعني it's like they didn't really want to do it it's as almost as if they didn't you know almost as if they didn't do it but they did but they didn't want to that's the per, uh, point 
And subhanAllah, at the only place they started searching for this cow, the only place they found this cow was with a young boy who was an orphan and who was very obedient and good to his mother. That's where they found, found this cow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also made that a means of benefiting the boy because of his righteousness, because of his bir to his mother and the fact that he was orphaned and um, he would benefit from the money that they had to pay. And they started um, bargaining with the boy, how much you know, will you sell us the cow for? And subhanAllah, um, they had to pay such a high price that the price was set at the um, cow skin, the cow skin worth in gold. That's how much they had to pay. The entire skin, whatever it was, you know, how many pounds it was, that had to be filled with like gold. So the, that's subhanAllah how difficult it was financially, uh, you know, and mentally for them because of their attitude. Okay, now to get into a little more detail about the murder, um, this man that had been murdered, one of the tafsir mentions his name is Amil, and um, he was actually uh, a wealthy man. So when after he was murdered, the Bani Israel were blaming each other, and it was going to be you know turn into a huge uh, you know huge disaster among their uh, community. They were uh, then, of course, you know, sacrificed, uh, told to sacrifice the cow. And what they were supposed to do is after sacrificing the cow, they had to take a piece of the meat of the sacrificed cow and hit the dead man with that piece of the cow. Now, this is in the Quran. We'll get to the ayah. And then what happened um, was that he came to life for a short time. It actually, one of the tafsis mentioned that when he came back to life, the wound, the, you know, before he had died, he had a wound, obviously, that he died of. Um, that started flowing again with blood, subhanAllah, for that short time that he came back to life. So Allah fully brought him back to life by after striking him with a uh, piece of the dead uh, cow and blood began to flow from the wound. And he was asked, who killed you? This, is, this was the purpose of sacrificing the cow. Allah was going to empower the uh, dead cow meat so that when it struck the murdered man, it would cause him to come to life in order to reveal the identity of the murderer and he came back to life and told uh, his people that it was my nephew who murdered me and the reason the nephew murdered him is because the nephew was the sole inheritor of his uncle's wealth and he wanted to you know the uncle I guess wasn't dying fast enough mm -hmm. so he wanted to you know uh, speed up the process and inherit his wealth which is why the um, grand eternal rule in the Sharia of Bani Israel was developed, which actually is applicable uh, and present in our Sharia as well. It's a qaida fiqhiyya, which is man ista'ajala shay qabla awanihi uqiba biharmanihi, which means that a person who um, speeds up a process before its due time, who speeds up a process yani unlawfully before its time, is punished by being deprived of that. So the nephew was deprived completely of the inheritance of his uncle. Um, and this is applicable in our sharia as well. We have the same rule in our sharia. In fact, the qaida fiqhiyah that I just told you is from our, uh, as part of our um, fiqh, usul uh, fiqh. So after he said that, that he killed, it was my nephew who killed me, he killed me in the jungle. And after saying this, he fell dead. He fell down dead again. So, um, so thanks to that nephew, we have this rule, I guess. So this was the wisdom of why Bani Israel had to sacrifice a cow. We see multiple levels of wisdom. There was not just the resolving the case of the murdered man, thereby averting bloodshed among Bani Israel who were ready to, you know, uh, harm each other but not admit to guilt, and also to um, remove the sanctity of cow worship from their hearts and also to benefit the young orphaned boy. So subhanAllah, look at the multiple levels of benefit from one command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is only what we can understand after going through a study of tafsir. And subhanAllah, how many more benefits must there be for that command that we will never know, perhaps? And how many benefits are there and wisdoms are there in the other commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we find it so difficult and we want to resist? And subhanAllah, at the end, who loses? We lose, right? Person who resists Allah is al-Qahar, he is irresistible. This is one of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He cannot be resisted. And part of that means his commands cannot be resisted. At least not without harming your own self, right? Um, okay, let's go on to 68. They said, pray to thy Lord. Okay, we actually finished that. We're on 72 now. Okay, this is the explanation uh, or the verses pertaining to what I just explained. 
And when you had killed a man, then you put the blame on one another in dispute and God wanted to disclose what you were hiding. So we said, strike the dead with a piece of this cow. This uh, God will bring the dead to life and shows you, you his sign so that you may ponder over. Okay, so um, here we see that another wisdom is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show his powers of bringing the dead back to life. Which was, subhanAllah, to impress on the hearts of Bani Israel is that soon you know you will die and Allah will bring you back to life for accountability and for hisab. So you better shape up and you know, stop all this disobedience and stubbornness that you're uh, showing. 74. Then your hearts became hardened thereafter. Then your hearts became hardened thereafter and became just like a rock or even harder. And there are rocks from which rivers come out and there are rocks which split and water issues from them and there are rocks which fall down in fear of Allah and fear of God. And God is not heedless of your deeds. Okay, now subhanAllah, uh, what is really tragic about Bani Israel <clears throat> and about all nations that disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that even after witnessing these clear signs, their hearts continue to harden. Not just that they didn't believe or didn't obey, didn't submit, they increased in their transgression. They became worse than they were before they saw the signs. SubhanAllah. Yani this is like the worst state to be in a constant uh, you know, state of increased uh, rebellion, of increased sinfulness. You know, you know, it's like you're in a downward streak where you're just increasing in your uh, sinfulness and it's just n no turning back. No turning back. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the similitude of the rock because some rocks are actually very um, beneficial to human beings because the rivers that come out of them, right? Uh, some of them have uh, streams uh, gushing forth. Um, some give out more water, some give out less water. So there is, and some, um, when, whenever there's a tremor or an earthquake, they fall down, right? Out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you see that even rocks in comparison to these people are showing some type of benefit to others and showing humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these people, that's why Allah said that they became hardened even worse uh, than, than rocks. So we seek uh, Allah's refuge um, from that. 175. Okay, now this address is now to the converts of Medina. The Muslims of Medina are now going to be addressed in verse 75 onwards. أَفَطَطْمَعُونَ أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا لَكُمْ وَقَدْ كَانَ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ يَسْمَعُونَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ يُحَدِّفُونَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَقَلُوهُ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ Which means now, do you hope that they would believe and there was a party of them that listened to the word of God and perverted it with understanding and they knew. Now, the background of this ayah is that the Muslims in Medina that were meeting these Jews and living with them, some of them for the first time. They were hoping that, you know, these people are, they considered them knowledgeable because they had the scripture, they had the book. So they thought that this knowledge was going to make them become Muslim. And some Jews, in fact, did convert to Islam, right? But m most of them did not. So um, they had this hope inside that, you know, Allah is now revealing all these stories about Bani Israel and, um, you know, they have a scripture th which contained the description of the Prophet wasallam, right? So inshallah, they're going to believe. So here Allah addresses these hopeful Muslims in Medina, saying that you think they're going to believe when there was a party of them that listened to the word of God and then they changed it while they fully knew what they were doing. Yani they deliberately perverted, changed the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is such a huge uh, crime that Allah says after doing something like that, do you think that they could possibly uh, believe? Now, um, the, the Jews, of course, they ha they knew about the coming of a prophet, right? And they had heard actually the mushrikeen or the, uh, before many of the Muslims actually became Muslims and became Sahaba, they had actually heard from the Jews about the coming of the prophet. And after he comes, he's going to prevail all over the world. So they were really excited and interested and hopeful that they're going to, inshallah, accept the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They had actually, the Jews had actually, of course, heard of a revelation. They knew about angels. They knew about divine law. They, all, they already all, uh, had all of these things. But what they did is the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ that were mentioned in their Torah, they actually changed 
that description. They even changed the description of the Prophet Wasallam. So that when the common people among the Jews would ask their, uh, you know, their rabbis about the description of the Prophet Wasallam, they would give them the altered version. They would not tell them the real description of the Prophet Wasallam. You know that uh, it was a monopoly, the scripture was a monopoly among the uh, priests and scholars of the Jews. Uh, the common people didn't have access to the Torah. Like we can open the Quran and read it. It wasn't like that for them. It was only the uh, priests, the high priests, and or the, or the rather the rabbis that had uh, access physically to that knowledge, and they were the ones who would uh, explain it to the people. So they could change, add, delete, copy, paste, whatever they wanted, and this is exactly what they did. And this is recorded. This crime of theirs is recorded in the Quran. So um, these new Muslims, uh, you know, the, the, the Sahaba in Medina, they thought, oh, the Jews, they're going to be the first ones to welcome the Prophet wasallam, And they were so sincere that they wanted to persuade the Jews, actually, the new Muslims. Um, they wanted to persuade the Jews to accept the Prophet wasallam, because, look, you have, you know that there was going to be a Prophet at the end of time that you yourself were waiting for, whose description you have in your book. However, they continue to um, reject and um, the munafiqeen, the hypocrites in Medina, right? Uh, the hypocrites are uh, Madani phenomena, right? Uh, they were, uh, they came, became a prominent part of the uh, society in Medina. In Mecca, you couldn't really, they weren't really there. Or they were, but they, they played no role. Because at that time, Muslims were um, suppressed. But in Medina, when Muslims were successful, compared to Mecca, uh, like one of uh, our teachers said that uh, hypocrisy is a phenomenon of success, right? If you, there's no success, if the Muslims are oppressed and they're low like they were in Mecca, there's no reason to be a hypocrite. You can be an outright kafir, right? Either you're a kafir or you're uh, a suppressed Muslim. Why would you be a hypocrite? Why would you pretend to be Muslim at that time? There's no reason to. However, when in Medina they are successful, they have their own state, they're winning battles, they're becoming a force, they're becoming successful, now there's reason to hide your um, uh, hypocrisy. There is benefit in pretending to be Muslim and really not being Muslim, right? So hypocrisy then, uh, he said, is the phenomena of success. So um, this is what uh, the hypocrites, when they saw the situation that, you know, these Muslims are trying to persuade the Jews to believe, but the Jews are not believing, they're rejecting. The hypocrites use this as a perfect opportunity to put doubts in the minds of the new Muslims. You know, um, this prophet is probably not the prophet because otherwise the Jews would have known. Because the Jews are waiting for this prophet. And they have the description of this prophet in their book. So the fact that they're not accepting it means he doesn't match the description. So this is the doubt that the hypocrites were planting in the minds of these uh, new Muslims. Trying to make them hypocrites as well. Otherwise they said they wouldn't have knownly rejected him, right? They wouldn't have ruined their hereafter. How would they ruin their akhirah? They believe in akhirah, right? So this is what the hypocrites would say to the Muslims, that they would not ruin their akhirah and reject this prophet. This means he's not the prophet, right? But unfortunately, uh, there is a pattern of um, rejection from Bani Israel anyway. So this is why they were continuing in rejecting um, the Prophet wasallam. So, you know, when we, uh, some people, uh, astaghfirullah, they criticize the Qur'an, may Allah guide them and us, um, and saying that Bani is, uh, Baqarah is very harsh towards Bani Israel, right? Astaghfirullah, you know, we can, obviously we don't believe this in any way. The, when we study the tafsir, when we um, learn about the attitude of the Bani Israel towards the Prophet wasallam and the message and their psychological background, their history, it becomes even more important to expose them, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't know why they're doing everything that they did. Why did they adopt this stubborn attitude towards the Prophet ﷺ? They had this pattern of behavior throughout their history. And they had various interests at stake. And the superiority complex, which never left them. They were very jealous that the Prophet was from the Arabs and not from uh, the Jews, right? They were used to having the Prophets from uh, Bani Israel, right? And most of the Prophets actually were from Bani Israel. So they were used to that. So they couldn't uh, digest, swallow the fact that now this last prophet that we have been waiting for, that's in our books, he's from the Arabs. They couldn't digest that at all. So um, this is why it's important to expose the past of Bani Israel so that these new Muslims in Medina would not become disheartened. They wouldn't fall into that doubt that the hypocrites were trying to make them fall into um, in thinking that you know the Jews would have believed if this was the real prophet. 
they're being told that no, they wouldn't believe because look at what they did. Look what they have been doing. So no, they wouldn't believe. Not because he's not the prophet, it's because they are who they are. Okay. So this is why you have to have this detail. So it's not that it's harsh, astaghfirullah, you know, there's a wisdom, a need, a necessity um, to have this level of detail about Bani Israel and their past. Okay, let's move on to um, 76. And when they meet those who believe, they say we are Muslims. But when they're alone with one another, they say, why do you speak to them what God has revealed to you that they may thereby dispute with you before your Lord? Do you not understand? Okay, so who are these people? That are saying this to the uh, Muslims when they meet them. We are Muslims. These are the, Jew, the Jews. Okay. So the Munafiqeen, the hypocrites, were also from among the Jewish people. It wasn't just the uh, Arabs. You know, we always think of uh, the Arab chiefs of Medina that were the hypocrites. There were also hypocrites from among the Jews who would feign Islam, who would pretend to be Muslim. And uh, they would see, meet the Muslims and say, oh, we are Muslim. But when they're alone, this is what they would say. Why do you speak to them? Which they would say to their fellow Jews, why are you telling them things that Allah has revealed to you so that they may dispute with you before your Lord? Don't you uh, understand? So they didn't want any of the truth uh, getting out. Okay, let's go on to 77. Do they even not know that this God knows what they hide and what they uh, reveal? So obviously there's no use in trying to conceal anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, because they wanted to hide the identity of the Prophet wasallam. So they didn't want other Jews telling the Muslims that we have the description of this Prophet وسلم, in our books. So they were like, why are you telling them that? You know, they're going to um, use that as a proof against you. You know, but SubhanAllah says, don't you know that Allah knows everything that you hide and you reveal? So it's kind of nonsensical. Okay, 70, uh, 78. And some of them are illiterate who have no knowledge of the book except some false hopes and they have got nothing but mere guesswork, right? So these are the ignorant masses of the Jewish people. Like we said, they had no access to the Torah. They would just follow what they were told. Uh, they were ignorant, right? They had um, whatever they heard from their scholars. Uh, things like, you know, nobody will go to paradise except a Jew. They would believe that, you know, so... Okay, this is not the Prophet's description. This is the real description, which was a false description. They would believe that. So, you know, this is what is uh, being referred to uh, over here. And also, one of the myths that they uh, uh, perpetrated was that no Jew will be in the hellfire forever. Because of everything your forefathers have done, uh, you're, not, you're not going to be in the hellfire uh, forever. So, they, this was common among the um, masses, uh, among the uh, majority of the Jewish people. So woe to those who write the book with their own hands, then they say this is from God in order to take on it a small exchange. So woe to them for what their hands have written, and woe to them for the sort of earning. Verse 79 makes it very clear exactly what the uh, scholars of the Jewish people were doing. The religious uh, guides were changing the book, writing the book according to their own, um, you know. It's, so it's not something that we interpret or find in tafsir. It's actually in the Qur'an. They were changing the book. They were writing the book. It's right here. So it's Al-Baqarah, uh, verse number 79. This is what the learned among them did. These are the best, supposedly the best of the Jewish community. Not only did they pervert the text, they also added things to, uh, of their own desire. They even added history in there. They added superstition in there. They presented it as if it were from God, as if it were from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they made it absolutely mandatory, wajib, fard for every Jew to believe in this book that they had kind of, you know, written by themselves. Otherwise, they were considered, a, a, you know, um, a heretic. They were considered like, you know, like a murtad would be considered, like someone outside of the fold. So, um, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying about them? For wailu lilladhina yaktubun al-kitab. Wail, you know, is halak, is destruction. It's, uh, wail is intense punishment, shadeed, yani, intense, painful punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and some of them have said that wail um, in uh, the tafsir is actually means it's a jahan, it's a valley in jahannam it's a valley in the so obviously it's a it's a horrible thing uh, and this is what is being said to these people who are changing and writing uh, the book with their own hands and they say the fire will not touch us but for a number of days say have you received a covenant from Allah that Allah will not break his covenant or simply you manufacture things about Allah which you do not know this was another belief that gave them a lot of hope is that you know even if we enter the fire of hell it's only going to be for a short time and they actually had a number they said it was 40 days 
We will be in the hellfire if we enter it only for 40 days because we had worshipped the calf for, for 40 days. And then after that, we're going to be uh, taken out. This was their, um, you know, their folly, obviously. 81. Nay, who earns evil and his evil has encompassed him. Those are the inhabitants of the hell. There they shall dwell forever. Okay, in the Arabic, it's bala man kasaba sayyia. Kasaba is to earn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran refers to our actions that we do as earnings. This is how serious our acts are before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is what we are earning, what we are preparing for ourselves, what we are sending forth uh, for our akhirah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that who, who, whoever has done evil to the point that it, is, it has encompassed the person, they are going to dwell in the hellfire forever. So Allah is clearing up this misunderstanding that they had, that, oh, we're going to be there only for 40 days. Allah says, no, if your evil has encompassed you, it is greater than your good, obviously, and, you, and they have not believed, then, of course, they're going to uh, be in the hellfire forever. And those who believe and do good works, they are the inhabitants of paradise, and there they shall live forever. Okay, now, um, let's go on to the next section, verse 83. And when we took a covenant from the children of Israel, worship none but Allah. Okay, now, the covenant, the ahd, um, is the promise between uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Bani Israel, right? And Allah has this between himself and other nations. Like he has it from us, he has it. He had it from Bani Israel. And there are different clauses in the Ahd, right? Our Ahd with Allah is the Salah, right? Is the prayer, among other things. And here for Bani Israel, it's the following things mentioned in verse 83. This is the thing that they had to do in order to fulfill their promise, their covenant with God. What is it? Worship none but Allah. لا تعبد إلا الله. Worship none but Allah. وبالوالدين أحسانا and being good to parents. وذي القربة واليتامى والمساكين and to uh, relatives and the orphans and the masakin, the poor people. وقولوا للناس حسنا and say good to the people. يعني speak in a good manner or kindly. وقيموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة and then um, you know establish the prayer and give the zakah. So the salah and the zakah again was always part of all the Sharia that Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed. Um, However, what did they do? Allah says, ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ مُعْرِدُونَ That then you turned away except a few of you and you are a people of swerving. Yani swerving from the divine laws. This has become your habit, your second nature. So um, what does this mean? This ayah means that most of Bani Israel were not sincere in their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most of them were not obedient to their parents, to their relatives, to the orphans and to the poor, not good to them, yani. And most of them did not speak, did not have good akhlaq, did not speak in a kind manner to others, and they failed to pay the mandated salah, uh, or the zakah rather, and establish the salah, okay? So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these clauses as the covenant between him and Bani Israel, and then he says that, ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ Then you turned away. It means that they failed at all these levels. They failed in all these clauses, except a few uh, of them. And they are also mentioned, right? That a few of them kept to these clauses. However, most of them were not uh, praying or not establishing the salah or giving the zakah or even being good to parents and family and those in society that deserved it. So you see that there is a spiritual failure, moral failure, societal failure. You know, there's failure uh, to uh, keep their covenant at so many levels. And when we took a promise from you that you shall not shed blood of one another and shall not expel your own from your native place, then you confirmed it and you yourself bear testimony. Okay, um, there was a covenant, of course, and this is in every religion, that you not kill your own people and that you not expel each other from their own land. Even this was violated. They began murdering each other, began expelling each other from their homes and helping each other in sinfulness and uh, rebellion. And um, what happened was that in war, generally, you're allowed to take, take captives, right? You're allowed to take prisoners of war. But the defeated side, the people that are left over on the defeated side become the captives of the, uh, victor, uh, the victorious party, right? The people who win the war. And so it was allowed for them to take captives in this manner. However, what they started doing is that they, would start, they started taking Jewish captives, Yani, they were themselves Jewish, and they started taking uh, captives who were also Jewish, and then uh, accepting ransom for them, yani making money off of them, right, from the other party. This would have been permis permitted if it was another group of people. You could not, you were not allowed to do that 
among your own selves, right? Like Muslims can't do this to Muslims. But this is what they were doing. The Jewish people, they were doing it to their own kind, which means that they were going to war with each other. The something that had been made haram to kill each other had been made haram. Obviously, that's haram in every Sharia. However, they full-fledged went straight out to battle with each other, with their uh, you know, Jewish brothers in faith. They would kill them, take them captive, and then have them ransomed. And this is obviously all unlawful. And this is mentioned uh, in the Quran here in verse 85. Then you are a people who shed blood among yourselves in the same way and expelled a party of yours from their native land, encroaching upon them with sin and tyranny. Now, um, there were actually two groups of Jews in Medina. One was Banu Quraiza and the second was Banu Nadir. Okay? And they were always fighting with each other. Okay? These are the two groups. And they were both Jews, both in, in, in Medina. And... Um, the Mushrikeen also had two groups in Medina, right? The Aus and the Khazraj, who later became Muslim, right? And they were also always fighting each other. So the Banu Qurayza were on the side of the Aus, and the Banu Nadir, they support the Khazraj and the battlefield and outside. So, you know, one Jewish party became friends or allied with one of the Mushrikeen, and the others took the other side. So when in some uh, battle one dominated the other, the strong repelled the weak, right? They destroyed their belongings, they came as a prisoner of war, then they would take money from them. So these were the groups that were at, it, at each other's throats all the time, and they would take each other, you know, ransom and captive. This is what is being referred to here in verse 85. And if the same people come to you as captives of someone else, you ransom them, although their expulsion was itself forbidden to you. You cannot, if, if it's haram to fight them, how can you then take them captive? If it's haram to expel them, then how can you accept ransom for them, right? So, you know, A to Z, it was just, it was just haram. Then do you believe in a part of the book and reject the rest? What shall be the punishment of those amongst you who do that by degradation in the present life and on the day of resurrection to be returned unto the most terrible punishment and God is unheedless of your deeds? Okay, now this uh, is very relevant to us. Do you believe in part of the book and reject the other part, right? This is something that I think every Muslim struggles with, right? It's very hard to uh, submit ourselves entirely uh, into the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something we don't want to fall into this category because this is what the Jews were warned about. Do you believe in part of the book and uh, reject the other part? Pick and choose according to your, um, to your whim. So inshallah, we don't want to fall into that mistake. These are the people who bought the life of this world for the hereafter, so their punishment shall not be lightened, nor shall they receive help. Okay, so this is clearly a preference of this life over the next. Okay, here, um, what was very... Uh, you know, very sad about the rejection of the Jews rejecting the Prophet, our Prophet Muhammad wasallam, Because before he came, they had a dua. They used to actually pray, Allahumma ansurna bin nabi al-maba'uf akhir al-zaman alladhi najna'atahu fi al-tawrah. They actually used to make the dua that, Oh Allah, give us victory through our, the Prophet wasallam, who's going to be sent at the end of time, the one whose description we find in our Torah. They would actually make this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their description, the description of the Prophet sallallahu in the Torah was so clear. It was so clear that Allah says uh, in another part of, of, of our Quran, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ This actually in Surah Al-Baqarah as well. That those that have been given the book, here is references to the Jews as well, that they know him or they recognize him just as they recognize their own sons. This is how clear the description of the Prophet Muhammad was in the Torah, that they had access to, that they knew about, that they had changed, of course, right? Um, so that they knew the Prophet Muhammad was the Prophet when, he, when they saw him, when they learned about him. They knew it was him. This is why Allah himself testified that they know him just as they know their own sons. There can be no doubt about a person knowing his or her own Son. This is how well they knew and recognized the Prophet Wasallam. This is how clear the description of him was in their books. So, the uh, sins that they were um, 
guilty of were extremely serious. And we're going to list some of them at this point. The ex very serious sins that they fell into. Number one is kufr in other than the Torah, right? They said that we're going to believe only in the Torah, which they themselves changed as they wanted. And, you know, if you don't want to believe in something, you just change it and say you have to believe in this version, right? That's very convenient. And then they said we believe in everything, we disbelieve in everything else other than the Torah, right? So that included the Quran. So kufr in everything other than the Torah, which includes the Quran, right? So they said we reject the Quran altogether. Number two, their great sin was that of worshipping the calf and taking it as a god, right? Shirk. This was their other uh, major sin, worshipping the calf and taking it as a god. Number three, they had a such a deep, intense love for this world so that it became sinful. The, you know, it was to such an extent that they became sinful because of it. Their actions were motivated by it. It is said that their love for this world was so intense that it was greater than the love that the mushrikeen even had for this world. The mushrikeen, the idolaters, um, even their love for dunya was not as intense and shadid as the love of the Yahud for um, this world. And actually Allah testifies to this because it says in the Quran that each one of them wishes to live for a thousand years. This is actually in the Quran. يَوَدُّ أَحَدُهُمْ لَوْ يُعَمَّرُوا أَلْفَ سَنَةً Right, each one of them wishes that they would, he would live, or she would live for a thousand years, in order to amass more dunya, more wealth. Right. So that intense love for this world, over the next, um, it reached the sinful, destructive degree, and this is what Allah is referring to in verse eighty-six. Right. أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوُوا الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا بِالْآخِرَةِ These are the people who have bought the life of this world for the hereafter. Prefer the life of this world because of their intense love for it over that of the uh, next world. Number four, they love to be in a rank superior to others. They had this superiority complex, and we can argue that it's still present. The superiority complex. Us uh, being better than others. Our deen being better than that of the others. We deserve to have the Prophet from among us. We are the uh, nation of prophets. Deen is our uh, monopoly. You know, it's our, um, it's, it's like all, almost like our property, you know. So they love to be in this position, which of course leads very easily to arrogance, as it did in their case, which is why they rejected the Prophet ﷺ. Number five, denying the prophets and divine books. Denying the prophets and uh, divine books. And number six, murdering the messengers. Actually knowing the prophets and then killing them. Murdering the messengers. And we're going to get a little bit into that um, in a few minutes, inshallah. 87. And to Musa we gave the book, and after him sent messengers successively. And we gave Isa, son of Mary, clear miracles, and gave him strength and power with the Holy Spirit. Right? Ruhul Qudus, yani the Holy uh, Spirit, you can translate it as that. It, was, it is not that whenever some messenger brought to you a command which did not appeal to your desire, you began to wax pride, yani become uh, proud. Then one party you belied, and one party you slew, you killed. So here, the murder of the, their prophets is recorded in the Quran, that they know uh, they knew that these were prophets who brought the commandments of Allah, and if they didn't like it, either they had a you know a two prong policy, either they would deny them, okay, we don't believe in you, you're lying, you know we don't agree with this, stubbornly reject, or number two they would kill them. This is the attitude that they um, had adopted. So who did they belie? They belied uh, the prophet Isa and Muhammad. Wasallam, right? Now here, uh, the verse mentions Ruhul Qudus, right? This, um, the Mufassirin have mentioned refers to Angel Jibreel. Angel Jibreel, uh, alayhi salam, was uh, the one who aided and helped Isa, Isa alayhi salam, right? He was, um, and also you will find in other, uh, some other Mufassirin, they mentioned that it may refer to Revelation, the Ruh Al-Qudus may refer to Revelation or to the Holy, uh, you know, uh, Holy Spirit of Jesus. But I think the best, Allah Alam, uh, the best interpretation is that it refers to Angel Jibreel, Gabriel, right? And the ayat are mentioned here as well, right? Atayna Isa ibn Maryam al bayinat right? What are the bayinat? Isa al was given two things, right? He was given the bayinat, the miracles, and he was helped with the Holy Spirit, with Jibreel. 
Um, there are many miracles of Jesus, alayhi salam, right? Um, it starts with his miraculous birth, the, the way in which he was born without a father. Um, you know, it was a sign for the people. The way that he spoke in the uh, cradle. Uh, how he would uh, bring the dead back to life with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would, um, you know, have a bird of clay, breathe into it, and it would become a real bird. Um, so, you know, there were many, many um, uh, miraculous signs. These are the Bayinat referred to in uh, verse 87. The clear signs, the any his miracles. These were clear proofs that he was a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But still, the same attitude of rejection. So when um, Allah says that فَرِيقًا uh, كَذَّبْتُمْ يعني A party of those messengers you denied. كَذَّبْتُمْ This is from كَذِب, right? كَذِب is to lie and also means to deny, right? So there's a party that you denied and, and that is included Isa and Muhammad وسلم, and وَفَرِيقًا تَقْتُلُونَ And one party of them you just killed. Now it, it's mentioned at the beginning of this uh, ayah, uh, verse 87, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابُ وَقَفَّيْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ بِالرُّسُلِ That we gave uh, Musa the kitab, the book, right, the guidance, the Torah. And after that we sent a string of messengers. These messengers were all from the Bani Israel. And they were sent for the guidance of Bani Israel. In fact, we're going to mention the messengers that were sent to Bani Israel after Musa alayhi salam. Number one, Yusha, which is Joshua. He was the first messenger sent or mentioned right after Musa alayhi salam. Joshua or Yusha in Arabic. Number two, Dawood. If you want to get a, a historical context, chronology kind of. Dawood. Number three, Suleiman, the son of Dawood, right? Number four, Uzair. Okay, now Uzair was a prophet. However, some of the Jews, they began worshipping him as uh, God, as, as divine. Number five, Elias. Number six, al -Yasa. Number seven, Yunus, which is Jonah in English. Number eight, Zachariah, the father of Yahya, right? He is the brother-in-law of Maryam, right? Number nine, Yahya, the son of Zachariah, marries the Maryam alayhi salam's nephew. And number ten, Isa. These are all prophets sent after Musa for the continued guidance of Bani Israel. And many of them they denied. And actually, both Zachariah and Yahya were killed by Bani Israel. Zachariah and Yahya. Zachariah, astaghfirullah, he was extremely old. Very, very old when he had Yahya, and obviously, you know, they killed him after that. So, you know, this is just tragic shamelessness. <coughs> now, uh, all of these messengers, all ten of them, were on the Sharia of Musa, alayhi salam, right? They brought no new Sharia. They were all in the Sharia of Musa, alayhi salam, except that Isa, he received the Injil, right? He received the Bible, and some of the Ahkam of the Bible were different from that of the Torah, right? Because remember it had been changed, uh, a lot of things had been made very difficult for the people to follow. Um, so some of those laws were repealed or changed, you know, some of them had different ahkam in the Injil that was given to uh, Isa. But other than that, overall they were on the Sharia of Musa alayhi salam. Now, what did they say? On explaining their rejection, what 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 did the Jews have to say for themselves in self-defense? How did they defend themselves? How did they justify this behavior of rejection after so many clear signs, after so many prophets, so many miracles? They said in verse 88, and they say there is a wrapping on our hearts. They said this is the reason why we cannot believe, we cannot accept anything. Our hearts are covered, they are wrapped. You know, you you have no access to them. Nothing can enter them. So um, Allah says, بَلَّعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ بِكُفْرِهِمْ فَقَلِيلًا مَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Rather, Allah says, Nay, God has cursed them for their unbelief, so very few of them believe. Now, actually, no one would say this in a negative way about themselves, that our hearts are covered. Because this sounds very negative to us, right? However, they would say it in self-praise. What did they mean? They meant our hearts are safe in a covering, so we will not be affected by your propaganda. Our hearts are safe in a covering. We are not impressed by anything other than our own religion. We cannot obey anyone. We cannot surrender to their, to your flattery, to, uh, to your magic, to you know this, these Quranic beautiful verses that you bring to us that are like sorcery, sorcery 
um, we're not going to be affected by it. We are safe. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies again their misconception. It's not that your hearts are safe. In fact, you're cursed. Big difference. And the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed them because of their consistent steadfastness in rejecting the message. Okay, 89. And when there came to them the book from God, confirming the book which is with them, and aforetime they prayed for victory over the unbelievers, now when there came to them that they had already recognized, they rejected it, so God, God's curse is on the rejectors. Okay. Now, uh, subhanAllah, the background of this uh, ayah, verse 89, it says that they, um, the book had come to God from them, which confirmed the book that is with them, right? The Quran, of course, a lot of it confirms a lot of what is in the original Torah, right? Because obviously it's from the same source. And um, they recognized it, okay? It says, now when there came to them, that they had already recognized, okay? There were many proofs that they knew about that proved that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Prophet, right? And in fact, they used to uh, pray for victory, uh, that Allah would give them victory through the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over the Kuffar. Before he, he, before he was sent this, what they used to say, that he will bring us victory over the disbelievers. They were waiting for him. In fact, there's a report by Ibn Abbas, uh, عنه, he's one of the Mufassirin, one of the explainers of the Qur'an. And there are reports that when the Jews of Khaybar uh, fought the Ghaftan tribe, okay, the Jews of Khaybar, which was uh, near Medina, when they fought the Ghaftan tribe, they would be defeated. Every time they would go to battle, uh, most of the time they would be defeated by this tribe called the Ghatfan, right? And they used to then, they started making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever they would meet this particular tribe in battle, they would say, Allahumma inna nas'aluka bi haqqi Muhammad, an nabi al ummi O oh Allah, we ask you by the haqq, by the right of Muhammad, that you would even say his name in their dua. This is the level of detail that was provided uh, to them. This is how well they knew the Prophet So they would, before he was sent, before the Prophet came, they would say, O oh Allah, we ask you by the haqq of Muhammad, the Prophet who is illiterate, الذي وعدتنا أن تخرجه لنا في آخر الزمان, the one that you have promised to us, that you will bring forth for us at the end of time. Allah, that you would grant us victory over these people. And when they would make this dua, they would defeat the Ghatfan tribe. SubhanAllah. So this is what Allah is referring to. Um, the root word of that is Fatah, right? Fatah, which means victory. So they would ask, for, before his coming, they would ask for victory uh, against the disbelievers through the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is the dua that Ibn Abbas um, has recorded that they used to make, SubhanAllah. So even after that, you know, it's just unbelievable. Okay, verse 90. Evil is the thing for which they have sold themselves, that they rejected what God had, what God had sent down, due to grudge that God should send down of His grace on whomsoever He will of His servants. And as such, they incurred wrath upon wrath, and for the infidels, humiliating is the chastisement, is the punishment. You know, they sold themselves for the worst price. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in other places in the Quran about the believers that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bought the believers, right? He has bought the souls of the believers, right? right? That Allah has bought the souls of the believers, yani they are completely under his command, submissive to his commands, so that for them, the return is Jannah, right? This is what they're going to get in return. Now here, what is Allah saying? That these people sold their souls for the worst thing, which is what? And yakfuru bima anzarallahu baghyan an yunazzilallahu min fadlihi ala man yasha. The reason they didn't believe, the reason they disbelieved in what Allah had revealed is because of this um, baghya, jealousy, grudge. Baghya literally is jealousy. They had a grudge or a jealousy that the Prophet was from the Arabs. Because of this reason, what does this show? This shows their superiority complex. This is proof 
of the fact that they considered themselves more worthy, more deserving of this uh, you know, title of prophethood. Why is the prophet from them? Allah clearly exposes them. This is the reason. This is the psychology, the exposure of their psychology. This is how they used to think. They rejected the Prophet ﷺ because of uh, jealousy that he was from the Arabs. And what did this attitude do, this attitude of rejection? And we, they had this pattern of disobedience that started in um, their uh, dealings with Musa. And what, how they treated him, they were disrespectful towards him. They used to like you know, annoy him, harm him um, through their disobedience and stubbornness. Took the calf for worship then denied many of the string of messengers that were sent after them, denied many of them, killed some of them. And now the last uh, you know, scene that we see of them is in Medina, right? Uh, what were they doing now? Continuing that same pattern. And this is why it says, So they incurred wrath upon wrath. Yani this present attitude in Medina now has renewed the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. This attitude that they even now uh, adapted. SubhanAllah. And for them is a painful uh, punishment, a humiliating punishment. Now, um, this is there's a difference between the uh, when a believer is punished in the hereafter, we seek Allah's refuge from that, and when a disbeliever is punished in the hereafter. The believer is punished for the purpose of purification in order to become free of her sin and inshallah enter Jannah. However, a unbeliever, a kafir is punished in order not to become purified but to be disgraced, to be humiliated. This is what it says, وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابٌ muhin. And for the kafirin, you will not find this for the believers. For believers, punishment in the akhirah is a purification. But here it says for the kuffar, the punishment is one that is humiliating. We seek Allah's refuge from that. Verse 91. And when it is said to them, believe in what God has sent down, they say, we believe in what is sent down to us and do not believe in what is beside it, although it is the book which confirms that book which is with them. Say, why then had you been killing the prophets of God before if you were indeed the believers? Okay. So, they said that, you know, when they were said to them, believe in what Allah has revealed, it was referring to the Qur'an, right? And also it is said to the Injil as well, the book that Isa was uh, given. But they said, no, we're only going to believe in the Torah. Uh, again, that's very convenient. Why? Because they, can, they changed it as they wished. So, you know, it's really easy to believe in something you can change whenever you want, whenever you like to, whatever. And, every, and then make it mandatory on all your people to believe in that. Otherwise, you're, uh, her, you're a her, heretic. So... They say that we're not going to believe in anything, even though it was confirming. A lot of the Quran confirms the Torah. They said we're not going to believe in anything other than that. So Allah then puts a very uh, sharp question to them. He says, فَلِمَا تَقْتُلُونَ أَنْبِيَاءِ اللَّهِ مِنْ قَبْلُ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ right? That if you believe only the Torah, then why did you kill the messengers? Because in the Torah, it's haram to kill anyone. If you really believe as you claim to in your book, in the Torah, and you want to reject everything else, then why aren't you following the commandments of what's in your own book, which is murder? فَلِمَا تَقْتُلُونَ أَنْبِيَاءَ اللَّهِ مِنْ قَبْلُ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Say, why then had you been killing the prophets of God before, if you indeed are believers? So what does this mean? They don't really believe in anything, right? They're just claiming to reject and be, you know, uh, partial, or selective believers. In fact, they don't really believe in anything except their own desires, except that which is convenient uh, to follow. 92. And there had come to you Musa with clear miracles, yet you made a calf of worship in his absence, and you are evil doers. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, is recalling to them the time that Musa had come to you with clear miracles, right? He had shown you so many signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, what did you do at that time? after you saw the miracle of his staff, after you saw the miracle of the white hand, right? Uh, one of the signs that Musa a.s. was given was um, his, uh, he was dark uh, in color. Musa a.s. was a dark uh, person. So one of the miracles was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused his hand to become uh, extremely shining white, right? That was one of the signs uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other than the um, 
you know, staff turning into a serpent, the hand uh, turning white, the dividing the river, you know, all of these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had shown them, you know. So Allah is re- reminding them there had come to you Musa with clear miracles. And these are some of the miracles. Yet you made a calf for worship in his absence, and indeed you are evildoers. So, Yani, this is uh, again recalling the attitude of their previous forefathers, even before them. 93, and when we took your covenant and towered upon you the Mount Tur, hold what we have given to you strongly and listen. They said, we heard and we did not obey. This is one of the reasons for their downfall, or the beginning of the end, as you can say. What did they say? قَالُوا سَمِعَنَا وَأَصَيْنَا That indeed we have heard and we disobey. This is what uh, the Prophet ﷺ, our, our Ummah, or the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, what we say, سَمِعَنَا وَأَطَعْنَا That we have heard and we obey. In fact, we're clearly commanded to say that in opposition, in clear opposition to the attitude of the Jews, which was سَمِعَنَا وَأَصَيْنَا That we have heard and we disobey. And absorbed into their hearts was the love of the calf due to their unbelief. So when um, Mount Tur was above them, remember we said at the beginning that one of the ways that Allah was scaring them into obedience was Mount Tur was hovering over them. It was raised and it was hovering over them like a shadow. And um, when they were giving, being given the commandments, they said at that time, سَمِعْنَا وَأَصَيْنَا That we have heard and we disobey. And absorbed into their hearts was the love of the calf due to their unbelief. Say, evil are the things which your faith teaches you if you are the holders of faith. So, you know, subhanAllah, they're being told that the reason that they uh, said سَمِعْنَا وَأَصْلِينَا is because of this worship, love of worshipping the calf, love of shirk that was still in their hearts that they had not completely become purified of after having left um, Egypt. Say if the last home is for you with God exclusively and not for others, then long for death if you speak truthfully, okay? Um, this is referring to the Jewish belief that only a Jew will enter paradise, right? So uh, a clear question is being put to them. You know, if you're sure that you're the only ones that are going to go to Jannah, then why don't you, uh, uh, why do you fear death so much? You know, they were the ones who wanted to live a thousand years, right? This is in the Quran. Uh, that they wish each one of them wishes that he would live a thousand years. Why is it that if you are going to Jannah, uh, if you're the only group that's going to Jannah, why don't why do you fear that so much? Why do you want to live for so long uh, in this world? So obviously another false claim, another false claim. And they will never long for death. Walayyatamanahu abada. They will never ever ever long for death because bima qaddamatadhi because of the sins that they have committed. Wallahu alimu bilwalimin and. Um, Allah is well aware of the uh, of the sinners. Okay, and here is what we have been referring to earlier. And you shall find them eagerest, the most eager of all for life. Yani even Subhanallah it says it right here. Wala tajidna hum ahros al nasi ala hayatin wa min al ladin ashraku. You will find them the most desirous of the life of this world, even more so than the mushrikeen. It's right here in this verse ninety six. يَوَدُّ أَحَدُهُمْ لَوْ يُعَمَّرُوا أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ وَمَا هُوَ بِمُزَحْزِحِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ أَنْ يُعَمَّرُ وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ That they are more covetous, more greedy for the life of this world, even more than the idolaters. Each one of them wishes that he may live a life of a thousand years, and yet such a long life cannot save him from the punishment, and Allah sees all that they uh, do. So um, they were actually extremely fearful of death, and they had they knew that they would face a horrible punishment in the hereafter. They did have this iman, and this is why they hated uh, hated to die. They wanted to live as long as they possibly uh, could. So obviously this is a full negation of their claim that they're entering uh, into Jannah, that they're the only ones that are going to go there. This um, clearly shows that that is not really what they know from the inside. Okay, um, 97. Say, whosoever may become an enemy to Jibreel, so he it is who brought down this word on your heart by the order of God, confirming the word which is before it and showing guidance and giving tidings to the uh, believers. Um, the Jews said horrible things about Jibreel salam. They in fact hated Jibreel because um, they said that he is bringing down revelation to this prophet, to Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So he's our enemy. He has brought so much trouble to our forefathers, you know, by bringing down revelation. Um, so 
they said that if some other angel will bring down revelation other than Jibreel, then we're going to believe in Muhammad وسلم, you know here they're trying to basically play God you know it is not for them to decide which angel brings revelation which prophet right this is one of the reasons um, that they hated Jibreel why is he revealing uh, bring wahi to Muhammad you know every again a ridiculous uh, ridiculous attempt to make an excuse to not believe say whosoever may become an enemy to Jibreel so he it is who brought down this word on thy heart by the order of God confirming the word which is before it and showing guidance and giving tidings to the believers whosoever is an enemy to God and his angels and his messengers and Jibreel and Mikael so Allah is an enemy to such Gafirin to such uh, disbelievers. Okay, so um, they were just, you know, uh, uh, they were, uh, you know, showing enmity even to the angels of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So Allah says, whoever is an enemy to Allah and His angels, Allah is an enemy to them. So He is not on their side. They are not His chosen people as they claim to be. They are not the ones that are the only group that's entering into Jannah, as is clear from these uh, verses. And he actually, they would have actually even say about Jibreel that he is not uh, uh, an enemy, an, an angel of uh, blessing, rather he is an angel of affliction. Astaghfirullah. They would say this is our, he is our enemy, he is not an angel of blessings, but of affliction. Okay, verse 99. And we have sent down to thee verses clear and enlightened, and none shall reject them except those who are disobedient. Yani the verses are so clear that there's no one in their right mind on the fitrah who is sincere, who is seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except that he's going to believe in them. But there will be always that group of people that are that don't want to um, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't want to follow his commands. They have other interests, their own desires or worldly interests at stake, because of which uh, you know those things are strong enough to prevent them uh, from believing because they're uh, because that is their nature. It is not the, is it not the case that whenever they make a covenant, a party of them throw it aside, nay, most of them do not uh, believe, okay? So, this was another unfortunate habit of Bani Israel, is every time they made a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a treaty, they would just fling it aside. It had no weight. They had no uh, moral or, uh, feeling of responsibility of, you know, um, of keeping the amana, of living up to the trust, of fulfilling the promise, fulfilling the covenants, they had no sense of this, unfortunately. Um, so they would they would easily break any covenant or treaty. And we saw this uh, in uh, if you study the seerah with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he entered into various uh, treaties with them. But what, what would they do? Break them, you know. So it was it was not even a big deal to them. So this shows us the nature of sin. And once a person begins to go down, there's no extent to which he can fall. You know, it's just an infinite descent uh, into d disobedience and destruction. There's, it's like no turning back once a person just allows himself that free restraint. And as Muslims, we have to uh, realize how dangerous um, continuous sinning can be because um, many years of gaining knowledge many years of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many years of diligence and knowledge and worship can be lost if we simply let ourselves go. If we simply let our nafs be in charge, the nafs is that, um, you know, it's that horse that has no reins, right? It has no restraint. And, uh, you know, it can, the rider is at the mercy of uh, the wild horse. That's the parable of the nafs. The example of the nafs is like a wild horse. So if we let our nafs become in charge, really, um, it, it, there, there is no uh, restraint at all. And this is what happened. This is what we learned from the stories of Bani Israel in this uh, surah, is that when they let themselves go, when they let worldly interests and their own desires be their guide, look to the extent to which they fell. That they did not even spare killing the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, what can be more serious than that? Uh, rejecting... Uh, the signs, breaking covenants, you know, denying clear miracles that no one can deny. So uh, this is something we have to be really careful about, is that um, uh, realize that, you know, if you let yourself go, there, there really is no um, limit to which you can fall. Okay, 101. 
When, and whenever there came to them a messenger from Allah confirming the book which is with them, then a party of the people of the book threw away the book of God behind their backs as if they do not know. Okay, so what, this is the uh, case of the Prophet said, He brought the Quran, they didn't care. They threw it behind their backs. Even the uh, Torah, they did, uh, did that to the Torah, the real Torah, they just threw it away, changed it. Um, so if they have no uh, attachment to their own book, if they can do this to their own book, then what about the Quran? You know, why would they have any, uh, you know, submission to that? They wouldn't. If they have no respect for their own scripture, they're obviously not going to show uh, respect for any other scripture, even if it is binding at that time to follow it. Okay, 102. And they followed what the Satans recited in the days of Suleiman's kingdom. Okay, here we come to another great. Um, okay, we'll just we'll just pause here for a moment. Inshallah.